السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم، الحمد لله رب العالمين، والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. أما بعد. Always my least favorite part of the day is the part after lunch. And I do always catch people dozing off. So when you get sleepy, feel free to get up, refresh wudu, and come back again. I've been saying that for years, I've yet to see someone do it. So if it doesn't work, I'll crumple a piece of paper and throw it at you. <laughs> Publicly embarrassed. Does that work? <laughs> but if you do feel sleepy, just get up, refresh will do, and come back, you know, get coffee, get tea, water, whatever it is you need to do. Um, and usually after the lunch break, I'll, I'll tell a poem. I'll say one of my poems on food. So, uh, just to get things started. Yeah. And I don't think I've said any poems before here, right? Great. We'll do another one tomorrow. But today, there was a friend of mine who used to eat together a lot, so I wrote him this poem. I said to him, Oh, and uh, you can stop recording. <laughs> Do we have to? I'll just leave it. So, <clears throat> I said to him, I see you coming in your girth. Eat and drink is what you were. Your only talk is what to eat, this type of chicken, that type of meat. This type of food, that type of dessert, you eat until your stomach hurts. Follow the sunnah, I'm sure you've heard. Fill with food to about the third. But you eat the whole bird, the whole chicken. Your only sunnah is finger licking. <laughs> okay. There's more where that came from. I only have two religious poems and five on chicken and other things. <laughs> no, no biryani yet. Um, there's a there's a DVD, uh, no a CD, audio CD. One of my favorites related to Dawah. It's by Sheikh Walid Basyun. Don't get me started on Sheikh Walid Basyun. Sheikh Walid, that's all I have to say. It's called A Message from a New Muslim, or A Message from a New Muslim. All right. You can get a hold of that. It's produced by Chinar Leaf. You can get a hold of that. It's just superb, superb CD. It's basically. Uh, they, what I like about it, first of all, is they did a study. The chef made a study before he just made the tape. He asked a lot of, spoke to a lot of reverts, you know, had a lot of, uh, you know, questions, <coughs> questionnaires, and he found out the things that they go through when they become Muslim. And he put them in the, in the audio, it's his voice, it's as if it's a non it's a new Muslim complaining to the Muslim community. It's superb. And these are actual problems that they go through. Message from a new Muslim, Chef Walid. Um, so, you know, if you can get a hold of that, listen to it, and, and it will help you deal with, with non-Muslims better. We were talking during lunch, and they were telling us about how, how some Muslims want to say the weirdest things during da'wah. I remember one time this guy became Muslim, so they had an iftar for Ramadan on his, in his honor, and uh, this, this other Muslim, other reaver, wanted to sit next to him and to talk to him about the deen and stuff. So he kept telling him, and this guy just became Muslim like a few days ago. He's telling him, in Islam, for some reason he just chose Tayammum to explain to this guy, this new Muslim. And this is how he worded it. He said, in Islam, when we can't find water to clean ourselves, we clean ourselves with dirt. And that guy was I see, okay. okay. <laughs> what kind of religion did I get myself into? If I can't find water, I take dirt and clean myself? He doesn't understand it. I mean, you know, you know it's the emblem. It's just a quick wipe with the face and hands. That's it. This guy thinks maybe you got to take dirt and just pour it over your head. So, yeah. So he listens to that tape. He discusses things like this. So, you know, he discovered that as a community, really, you know, this whole Dawah thing, it's a community project. And it has to do with a lot of issues from ilm, from patience, from terbiyah, from wisdom. And... So many times, you know, this, this new revert might make a mistake in Salah and the uncle might smack him after the Salah. Because, you know, why did you do this thing correctly? Talk about became Muslim three days ago. So our, our community is not even re really ready and able to accept and receive these new Muslims. And Allah had the complaints, you know. From, I remember one time this guy took a shahada in the masjid. And just look, within minutes, the, the, or the, all the disagreements that he went through, within minutes. So... 
The first guy came, shook his hand, congratulations, becoming Muslim. The next guy came, hugged him once, congratulations, becoming Muslim. Then the next guy comes, hugs him three times. <laughs> and then, then the next guy comes, hugs him three times. Then he tells him, the Prophet used to hug three times. Okay. So then I, I was watching this poor guy. The next guy comes, and he starts hugging the guy three times. And then he says, three times, right? The guy tells him, no, once. And already he's <laughs> gone through all this, you know? Or the thing about, you know, remove the gold. And, you know, the guy take, becomes Muslim and is like, tell him, tell him to take the gold off. You know, Shaykh Jaffer was telling us how some, some rich guy became Muslim in the Philippines, so he invited everyone to his mansion. And so during the, the dinner, he's passing out, you know, food, drinks to everybody. And there was guys sitting next to the Sheikh and told him, tell him about the gold ring, tell him about the gold ring. Yeah, he became Muslim in the morning, yeah. This morning he became Muslim. Immediately you want him to, to, to take off the gold ring. But you don't even do things like that when it comes to you. Yeah. And now a Muslim, born Muslim, practicing, you tell me, what you did is incorrect, it's actually a hadith in Bukhari. And they resist. They won't change. And you want this guy to change his life overnight. You know? So there's a lot of wisdom involved with dealing with new Muslims. Message from a new Muslim, if you can get your hands on that, it's excellent. Um, during the lunch break, one brother said that one time he was lowering his gaze and talking to, uh, there were two women who was lowering his gaze and talking, one of them kept laughing. Probably he assumed she was laughing at the idea that he was not looking at her. So what do you do in a situation like that? I mean, basically, uh, where is the book? Okay, well, anyway. Uh, what, what do you do there? You know, do you just ignore the laughter or do you, do you address it? Who would ignore it? Hands up. Who would address it? And who's just Canadian? <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So a lot of people are undecided, right? Okay. Um, but those who would address it, what would you say? Yeah? Sorry? Sorry? You teach kids or something? You're a second grade teacher or something? <laughs> Share the joke with the rest of the class? <laughs> okay, ask a question, see if they're following. But we're saying you said you would address it, right? So how do you address it? I mean, address it directly. Oh, I mean. directly. Yeah, yes, sir. I know I'm kind of funny with them, but you don't have to laugh. <laughs> I like that. I like humor with these things, you know? I like humor. You know, like sometimes people tell me things like, you know, well, you know. You know, if he's just waiting for the violence in Islam, you know, or, you know, you guys have to, you know, if your religion commands you to kill people. And I always say, you know, if our religion commanded us to kill people, we wouldn't be talking right now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't do that part, but I do say that. I just added the last part for the last, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so good. So I like that. It's a joke. It could work very well, you know. It's funny looking. Uh, anyone else? Anyone else? All right. Uh, now, yeah, go ahead. Um, in regards to Muslim, um, would you like me to tell you, like, I would tell, would you like me to tell you why I'm not looking like it, like, what is Islam useful? Okay, so that, you're going to address it directly, yeah. Because the brother had a decent hunch that she was laughing because he's looking, he's lowering his gaze. So then, then address it. Look, there is no script. I mean, I can never imagine myself standing in front of two people, while one of them is just giggling and laughing her heart out at me. And I'm just, not, I'm just not commenting, I'm following my script. There is no script. I'll stop and find out what she's doing. Well, you know, what's the matter with you? <laughs> you know? In a nice way. So, find out what it is. There's no script here. I mean, I just can't just sit there and just... Someone giggling at me the whole time and I never address it. And, and maybe it's not the, the, the gauge thing. Maybe I need to find out what it is. Plus, do you think someone who's laughing, who's who ridicules you to the point where they're laughing at you, might become Muslim? No. Yes. Probably not. Probably not. So let me fix that issue. So if you think my religion is a joke, because of what I'm doing, most likely you probably won't become Muslim, unless I address that issue. So address the issue. There is no script. Okay, and address it however you want, and, and you would ask, you know, you know are, you, are, you, are you, whatever way you want to ask, are you laughing because I'm not looking at you, or you know, may I ask what's funny? You can, you can say that. May I ask what's, what's funny? Okay. But, right. um, where was we? Don'ts. All right, now I can easily take all the do's and reverse them and say these are the don'ts, right? I think there's only one repetition in here because there's something else about it. 
So we already discussed the first one. Second one, don't use uh, annoying approaches. I'm going to skip the example there. It's just a funny story, but I'm skipping it. Don't be evasive. Isn't that the opposite of be straightforward? It is, right? So why did I put it here again? Because when you're evasive, it adds another... You know what I mean when I say don't be evasive. Mm -hmm. And someone asks you a certain question uh, about, about, let's say, the Prophet and the age of Aisha, and then you don't answer that question, you move around to something else. They catch that. They're not dumb. They'll catch that. And they'll think, oh, I got him. And his religion doesn't have an answer for this. And they don't have a good explanation. That's why. So I'm putting it here because it adds another element. When, when you're not being straightforward, you're being evasive, it adds this other element that you have a religion with a lot of holes in it and you don't want to address an issue because you don't have a good answer for that issue. I remember one time this Da'iya was being evasive. This guy says, look, answer my question. Wait, wait, I'll come to your question. There's a building in the desert. He has this analogy he loves. He wants to use it even though it's not the appropriate place. And that guy started to smirk like, okay, I got him. He can't answer me. That's why he's going on to something else. So he thought in his mind, halas, I destroyed this Muslim. They don't have any strong arguments, they're just like us, they're weak. So don't be evasive. Um, you know, uh, let's see. yeah, so by the way, like, I, like for example, the, the golden rule, you apply that in that scenario. You don't apply it in every scenario. You know, I might, we might discuss, I might tell you the story of this person, and then I said this, and they said that, they became Muslim. That's a specific scenario it happened to work. Now don't think, like I said, there is no formula, no magic wand, so don't think I can just take this because it worked here and apply it over there. It doesn't work like that. And so, uh, let's look at one issue with, with uh, this is a true story, an actual question that came to me. This man, uh, well actually he asked, he asked uh, a sheikh this question, so he said, um, basically he has a non-Muslim friend who said there's nothing wrong with yeah, and fornication and things of that sort, because as long as it's done with the consent of the participants, then there's no problem with it. So the Muslim then tried a da'wah technique from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So he tells him, "Would you?" And you know this the generation when the Sahabi came and he says, "Would you accept that for your mother?" He said, "No." Would you accept it for your sister? He said, "No." So he tells him, "Would you accept it for your mother?" He said, uh, "Sure." I mean, if she wants it, would you accept it for your sister? I mean, sure, if it happened to do with her consent. So the guy, the Muslim, just, he was dumbstruck. I mean, this is a method of the Prophet Wasallam, and it failed. How can the Prophet's method fail? So who will put their hand up and tell us why this method did not work here? Yes, sir. So the sister is saying the culture is different, and if we want to use instead of the word culture something bigger than culture, that it would be Italian. No? Italian. Italian? Italian. Mentality. Is that what you're saying? Mentality. Okay. I didn't have the, I didn't know they had Italians in the region. I'm like, forget the belt. Come on, you gotta like that. Okay. So, religion, right? The Prophet used a technique with a Muslim. First of all, understands halal haram, understands haya, understands obedience to Allah, understands all these things. And he was coming to get a ruhsa, like an allowance from the Prophet. But it worked because he had all these, you know, he knew jealousy, envy, ghayra, all these things he had. That's why it worked here. So, the person, the mistake the Muslim was making, he took a method. Something that worked on, uh, yeah, the Prophet used it on a Muslim. He was trying to apply it to a non Muslim. The person said, Yeah, he doesn't know about zina being haram and aqab and punishment. He said, Okay, yeah, if she's consenting and she says, Yeah, khalaf. That's what it didn't work. So, what I'm trying to say, don't think you can take a, you know, a technique or formula and apply it where it doesn't belong. It will probably work where it does belong, but not where it doesn't belong. Yes? You're very right. You're very right. 
you, and, you, and I think you all know this. Sometimes you find books to exaggerate about jahiliya time. Until you see was ramped and stuff. You know, when the Prophet came, like the Khair's story, the Prophet came to get the, the pledge from the women after the conquering of Mecca. Amongst the things, the conditions was that they do not commit zina. So Hind bint Udba, anha, she said, Awa doesn't in hurrah? Free woman commits zina? Can you imagine in jahiliya, free woman didn't commit zina? And now look what's happening to the Ummah. Muslims. So yeah, that's very true. So exactly what's so that the cultural argument does hold. Yeah. But uh, and I I use the religion more so because, you know, uh, because now these arguments are just all over the place and you might find people here and there from this culture making the same argument. But Prophet use it on a Muslim and here now this is a person living in this time, different culture, different religion. So it won't have, have it won't necessarily be applicable just as it's taken from here, copy and paste, you know. But, so, uh, the, what I meant by that last point, let's not push in technique, is that it's not really a technique, it's just that an argument that when, some, when you're trying to get someone to, to accept Islam because he has the ingredients or she has the ingredients, always a Muslim jumps in and stops you. No, no, don't push him. Do you see me pushing him? You're the one pushing. He, no one's pushing over here. So, I'm just talking to the person. And you know, I don't know how it works in Canada, but in the States, you really can't push people. You can't. They'll tell you in so many ways that if they're not interested. And they'll tell you in French, and they'll use sign language as well. So, <laughs> it's not like you can push someone to become a Muslim, force him to wear a kufi, and grow his beard, and come to the masjid. You can't. So, it's just, uh, and, and I'm going to come back to this. There's a theory, perhaps, why these people don't understand this. Um, okay, very good. This is one of our discussion points at lunch. Never interrupt a person that's giving da'wah. And don't do this when you have your Muslim Awareness Week and everybody's going to be involved in it, even if you're not officially someone standing behind the da'wah table, you're still involved in Muslim Awareness Week, am I right? Yeah, because you're inviting people to it, you're letting your classmates know about it, you're inviting your friend, you're saying everybody come, even though you're not speaking, you're not possibly giving da'wah, but you're helping. You're part of this ummah, part of this group and on campus. So. What happens is that a lot of people are excited, everybody wants to give da'wah, everyone's got this little fact about Sayyidina in the Qur'an and they want to throw it in. So you've got five people in a circle around the non-Muslim, he's in the middle, and then all of them are interrupting each other, and he has to follow all of them, because Allah tells us to, and he's just looking around, everyone's saying one word, and he's trying to, who am I going to pay attention to? Or he might feel intimidated. And everyone's interrupting. And remember, we said we're not just throwing information at people like we described what, a month and a half ago, that you're taking people through an organized thought process. And so, in order to do that, I can't go from here to here. If you interrupt me and take, me, take us over there, then you interrupt me again and we go over here, and then I try to go to the next stage, you take us somewhere else. It doesn't work like that. And the story goes there, there was this event in a masjid, and I was trying to give that out to someone talking about Tawheed, working my way to the prophets, the pillars. And there was this MD, doctor, and uh, they, uh, this guy basically, he had some scientific fact in the Quran about chlorophyll. He, wanted to, he, was, he was itching just to get it out. You know, he thought, mashallah, this will, this will bring him to Islam. So I'm talking about Tawheed, he interrupts me. And I don't know where the, brain, yeah, where the thought is that when, you, no matter what I'm talking about, what, how does it work when you just interrupt someone? And then they're giving that you interrupt, you jump in with some, some fact. You, know. you don't do that with anything else in life. You know. Anyways, so this guy jumps in talking about chlorophyll in the Quran. He was just waiting for me to breathe so he could interrupt me while I'm catching my breath about chlorophyll in the Quran. Now he's talking about this, the miracle of green chlorophyll. The guy didn't even look interesting. So what? Chlorophyll. Then I'm waiting for him to breathe. You know what I mean? He takes his breath, I jumped in immediately. So anyways, going back to our topic, we're saying that, this, this, that, then he's waiting for me. The minute I catch my breath, he jumps in with the chlorophyll again. How do I get rid of this guy? So until finally I saw one of my partners, because if the partner was there, he would fix it immediately. That's why it's so good to have a partner. None of my partners were there, then I saw one of them from the distance. And all we had to do was lock eyes, and that's it. I have to wink and from <laughs> That's it. The minute he saw me, he knew what was going on. He came immediately and pulled the doctor aside about the chlorophyll, and then I finished talking about the guy. About the guy. So, uh, so don't do this to each other. Don't interrupt. You have a great point. You're itching to get it out. Guess what? There's a thousand and one other people. You can go tell them about it. You don't have to interrupt this guy, and you're going to come and ruin my catch. I worked hard, and I caught this guy. He was walking, 
I caught him and I'm stopping dog pain. You go catch your own guy. Go get your own prospect and give him down. All right? But unless, like, what's a very good reason? Like, they overlook a certain point. The prospect asked them a certain question, but they didn't get it. But you got it. So you ask, you, you fix or you answer that question. That's a good reason to interrupt someone. Um, don't get into a negotiation, which is, uh, you know, I think you, I think, alhamdulillah, this, next, this new generation, you don't have to deal with that too much. But with all due respect to the older generation, oh man, they negotiate so much. You've, have you ever been to an interfaith with, with some older people? It's a nightmare. Nightmare. They have no clue how to run interfaith, you know. And uh, they just make it a negotiation where, you know, you, let's all go to Jannah. Hey, we, you, know, you go to Jannah, I go to Jannah. And they just start to negotiate. But of course, we don't negotiate in, the, in Islam. And Allah Azza wa tells the Prophet Sallallahu in Surah Al-Qalam, they wish that you would compromise with them, so they would compromise with you. But we don't compromise. That's why we all know Surah Al-Kafirun. Al-Kafirun, ma And it came after the, the offer they made. We worship your God for a day, you worship our God for a day. Then they said a week, then they said a month, then they said a year. And you know after a year of worshipping Allah, they're not going to go back to worshipping stones. Still the Prophet refused. Because we don't negotiate. <clears throat> I think it was another point about, yeah, I mean, there's some things, like uh, the story I always tell about how uh, this guy, you know, he was addressing a bunch of imams, and he said, you guys need to be creative in your da'wah techniques, and he told the story about how he used to go with a kafir friend, and the kafir would ask for uh, champagne, he said, I would get orange, uh, uh, apple juice, so he thinks I'm drinking champagne. So is this, and he said, that's an innovative way of giving da'wah. Okay, I need to understand what's so innovative about that. So, this guy is supposedly going to become you know, closer to Islam because you're getting boozed up or something? <laughs> Why would he want to become Muslim? If he sees you drinking out, would you say, oh, he's drinking champagne? Maybe I can become Muslim too. Why? So, uh, but that's just, again, this people trying to negotiate, trying to water down Islam, make it look like Christianity, and that might entice the Christians to join into Islam. You know, historically that has backfired severely for Christians when it comes to the pagan faith. You've probably, you're aware that there are many pagan practices in Christianity today. How did they come there? The Christian du'at back then thought it was in the interest of bringing people into Christianity to make Christianity similar to paganism. And subhanAllah, over the years, the pagan practice had lived and the Christian one died, like, you know, Christmas. You know, bringing a tree and decorating it and all that stuff. Pagan practice, pagan date, 25th of December, even similar to a pagan goddess or Mithra or Mithras that had the sun and all that. So, uh, and then even though clearly in the Bible it says, it says it's not permissible to bring a tree into your house and decorate it and all that. So it's a bid'ah by their standards, right? And, but again, same thing with Halloween. The pagan practices are what lived and nothing Christian remains, Easter, so many things. So, the point is, some Muslims try to do the same thing, it doesn't work, and it backfires. So they try to water down Islam, make it look like Christianity, that might bring the Christians into Islam. Well, guess what? If you make Islam look a little Christian, and they have 100% Christianity, <coughs> why should they feel compelled to enter into Islam? Don't give up too quickly if the person you know, seems uninterested. And don't just give up too quickly. And sometimes, you know, we, we've encountered people that either were just being, you know, sarcastic or, or they were like, uh, yeah, you know, smiling sarcastically, things like that. You keep going, and subhanAllah, they end up becoming Muslim actually at the end of the talk. Versus what if I saw him, you know, smirking and trying to be a wise guy, and I just walked away. Yeah. So it's, it makes more sense. Keep going with it. Don't give up that quickly. All right? Once you do give up, I really can't tell you. Sometimes you give up a little bit before, you know, think good things might have happened. And sometimes you give up exactly at the right time. But we'll, we'll discuss it more. Um, falsify or exaggerate information. And again, this is kind of like what happens at Interfaith. They tell you, you know, Muslims believe that, uh, that the Christians will enter paradise. It says so in Surah Al-Baqarah, and the Jews also will enter. And then that, that's we're falsifying good information. Then the Muslim sits down, the Christian gets up and says, well, we're all, you know, children of God, and therefore I'll see you when you get to paradise. Now, we're all lying to each other here. 
So and a lot of people, they're confused. They think that in order to coexist peacefully, you need to agree. There's no such thing. You don't need to agree at all to live with people in, in peace. All you have to do is understand each other. You know? When you don't understand each other, there's the fear of the unknown. When you know each other, it eliminates, it removes that fear. That's the end of the story. So you don't have to agree in order to live together peacefully. Just understand each other. So if I lie to you and tell you we think you're going to paradise and we don't, and then you lie to us and say we're all children of God, we're all going to paradise, and we're not, that means we just we don't still we walk out from that church or from that group building, still we don't know each other. So that's why you know, make sure you know, and exaggerate information, something you may have heard this story by some Muslims. Islam gives the women more rights than they're, than they're given in the West right now. Is that a true or false statement? It's false. It's not true. They give them crazy rights here that really don't even belong to them, these rights. They have given them these rights in the West. Islam didn't give them these rights. Allah gives them the rights that, that they deserve. But they went overboard. So it's not a true statement. It's an exaggeration. We don't want to exaggerate. We'll tell it as it is. We don't need gimmicks ever to spread Islam. But what I'm saying by change the method, uh, not the message, it's that same message. It comes to you through internet, audio tape, CD, you know, a speaker, a live speaker, microphones, dawah in the street, dawah at university, whatever it is, but the message is the same. It can come through video, through radio, but the message is the same. But the method can change, not a problem. So, like, one because this came about one time. Someone was telling me there was something wrong with the dawah table, and and maybe we're not saying the right thing. But if you're talking about tawhid and pillars, you for sure are talking about the right thing. Maybe you need a different method. That's it. Something to attract them. Things of that sort. But uh, yeah, and I think we discussed that. That's the that's the uh, the interfaith thing. Don't make misrepresent. You know, Islam says sometimes. Okay, what if someone comes to you and says, you know, what will happen, what do you Muslims believe will happen to us Christians? Somebody answer that question. Yes, sir. You're going to help. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Anyone want to word it differently? Same, same meaning? Yes, sir. Sorry? You will not be resurrected? They will be resurrected. Christians will be resurrected. The Mormons? Because if they won't be resurrected, then you know, it's not a bad deal. So as a Christian, you have to deal with the Day of Judgment, right? Yeah? If you don't submit to the will of Allah, you will not be accepted in the Day Okay, good. What's that? If you die worshipping more than one God, mm -hmm. in the world of hell, if you die worshipping more than one God. Okay, good. Yes, sir? Any Christian, Muslim, Jew, atheist, or anyone who dies associating partners with God and not worshiping God alone will burn in hell. Mm, I like that. You like what the brother Shiraz was saying? He added Muslim in, which makes it like it's not saying just you. I like that. I've never heard that before, but it's good. Anyone else like that? Wow. <laughs> Tough. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. It's nice. Okay, sister, in the back, and then we'll come to you. Oh, sorry, sorry. Is that what you were going to say? Yeah. He's saying that that you know, um, you know, anyone, whether Muslim, Christian, Jew, or so, who dies associating others in worship with Allah will, will go to the hell of fire. So he even put Muslim in, there, which is a true statement. So he's saying it's not just us versus you. But now, let me tell you something. Most of the time, when a Christian asks you this question, for say, let's say it's a Christian, they're really just trying to see what you're going to say. They're just trying to see if you have the guts. Because they know the answer. You think they don't know the answer? Do you really think they don't know the answer? You don't? Okay, you do? They know the answer, more, most likely. Why? Because they know that just about every faith believes they're right and everyone else is wrong. If they're right, they're going to paradise and everyone else is going to the other place. Because if we're the only ones who are right but we're all going to paradise, it really means we're all right. They know this concept, people. It's not, it's not going to be like, well, I never. <laughs> <laughs> they know it. They know it. So they just try to say how brave you are, how are you going to word it, are you going to be diplomatic or not. Because if you ask them where are the Muslims going, guys will burn in hell. 
you know, when the rapture comes, we'll all be raised to the cloud, the Muslims will be nuked, and then when all the nuclear stuff is gone, we come back to Earth and live peacefully. <laughs> okay, that's nice. Let me tell you how it's going to go down. <laughs> anyway, the point is... <laughs> the point is... Um, just in a nice way. Now, we need, to, we need to note here that you can't tell them where they're going, right? In, in Islam, general, we say in general, you know, you know, Jews, Christians will not go to, to paradise. But we don't say this guy won't go to paradise. And I can't say, you know, George Bush will go to the hellfire, right? I can hope. <laughs> but you can't for sure say this guy will go to that. You can't. But you, as a co collectively, as a group, people who commit shit, yes, they will go to that. Um, uh, don't make the counselor come through with this kufr. This is a rule that the Da'at made. It's just, it's just really good. Says, if you tell them, win your kufr, you'll be all right, you go to paradise, what's the need to, for, for them to become Muslim? And tell them, you know, the Quran says Jews and Christians will enter paradise. So, want to become Muslim? Well, no, you just gave me the dalil that I enter paradise, so why should I become Muslim? Uh, don't make a judgment based on looks. Have you ever, have you ever done that? You looked at someone and said, I won't waste my time with him. You ever done that? Yes. Anybody? <coughs> Just a few people? Okay. What did that person look like? That you want to share? Mm -hmm. And what, what was it about them? Just a homeless guy. None? A homeless guy. Okay, homeless guy. Okay. What about you? Uh, same, yeah. same thing? Okay. Anything beyond homeless that you just felt, uh, Yes, sir? Gothic kind of thing, black on black, black nails, black teeth, everything, yeah? <laughs> what? Classmate. Classmate? Yeah. What was about their look that made you just not? Um, his teeth. His teeth? <laughs> what are you doing, a dental commercial? Yeah? <laughs> the guy has a brat, you know, rotted teeth, you won't give him dawa? <laughs> You don't want to talk to him. Maybe he has bad breath. I don't want to give him that one. <laughs> By the way, tic tacs are your friend when it comes to that one. Have mercy on people. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. So you know. So you know what? Remember the beginning that he to the shad, he to the field. You just have to direct people to the truth. That's your job. Doesn't matter what they look like. Doesn't matter. And the example I give because this guy really looked extreme. We were at the Million Family March. This guy, tall, pale, white guy, big guy wearing a sleeveless shirt, got tattoos from his neck all the way to his wrists, you know, all kinds of devils and all kinds of weird things. He's got, you know, his front four teeth, all gold. He's got bandanas, piercings, anywhere you could put one on your face, all right? And white contact lenses. White contact lenses. Just imagine what this guy looks like. Pale, with all the blue and white contact lenses, gold and piercings, and he's walking like this. And I saw, I took a look at him, I saw him coming. And then I looked over here, I saw a man and his wife. I saw the birds singing, I saw the butterflies. <laughs> Why would I waste my time with this guy? I actually looked at it and said, I don't have time for this shaitan. And I went over to these guys, and I spoke to them for a little bit. When I turned my head, a brother was calling us to hear him take the shahad. He said, I got out of bed today searching for Allah. That's what he said. I got out of bed searching for Allah. And he just, Allah brought him to some Muslims giving da'wah. He became Muslim quickly. And then he was telling us this. He said, look, I don't want to just do this right now. And forget about it. He says, I want to become a, Mus a good Muslim. I want to learn to pray. I want to become an excellent Muslim. I lost out on that good shahada because I made a judgment based on looks. So I, you know, I learned from that day, no matter what the person looks like, I'm going to give them da'wah. Right? I don't care if they have... A telephone pulled through their nose, okay. <laughs> okay. Got that joke, huh? Alright, let's look at some of the techniques we have in the room here. Should I? Um, what if you're giving that war, like, you don't have a partner, it's, it's like Islam again this weekend, it's, it's, uh, everywhere, it's all dates, it's like many people. Uh, and another brother comes, like, you're, you're talking to an non-Muslim, and another brother comes and just observes. Mm -hmm. He's just there. He's not in, he doesn't drop. He doesn't no move. Problem. He just sits there and serves. No problem. One guy, right? Yeah. Not a sure. Another guy comes. I think maybe three is probably at least in the states. Three is not pushing it too much. I don't know what it is in Canada, but you know, three is not bad. 
But if what if you see four or five and you're alone, right? But someone across the room from the other table sees five people and you around someone, he might actually go to them. He knows they're the other four are spectators. He might pull them aside and say, look, we don't want more than two people crowding around one person. That's it. But if, you know, what if five people crowd, you have no partner, and so on and so forth? What are you going to do? Sir? I just, I just, uh, I'm just thinking, is it, I know we can't make it a rule to help me have one-on-one, but I feel like being culture here, people get offended or intimidated with more than one person because it's, the, it's what the Mormons do, you know, they all tell them the two, and it, it could be like a, like, a, like a battle, you know what I mean? It's like they have, mm -hmm. two people have the upper hand, you know, they're outnumbered. Well, I would advise you to not take my opinion on it. I would advise you to, to test it out and to see how that works. And, uh, and you might even do a survey with Muslims as well. So, you know, do you feel uncomfortable? Because you guys are Canadian. Do you feel uncomfortable when two people talk to you? And Because right now we're just, we could go off of your hunch and my hunch. But let's, let's test it and see. Um, I don't know Canada well enough, but I'm... I'm hoping that two is not really a big problem. What do you? Okay, what do the rest of you people feel? Um, uh, two is a problem. Put your hand up. Three is a problem. Put your hand up. Four is a problem. Put your hand. Up. No problem. Put your hand. Up. Any number. Okay. Uh, you want to add something? Yes. Uh, like like people here like like they're much more um, emotional. Like the, the last time someone like came up right to my face and just started like 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 being honest and straight up. He was actually Australian. He was, he was, he was just going to school. Here. Oh, okay. All right. Should I ask? What I meant by that is, uh, it was actually me who was feeling uncomfortable. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so you're the sensitive one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Excuse me. It's just like you're. You get a sense. It's like, okay, what are you doing here? Mm -hmm. You're gonna make him feel uncomfortable, and I'm just waiting for. Uh, the, the brother was spectating just to jump in with some random point. Yeah, so I know I what you're talking about. And actually, to be honest with you, I feel uncomfortable like that as well. Especially now, I mean, when, you know, oh, let's see what brother Kamal is saying at this guy. <laughs> and they're expecting me to be saying some, laying down the heavy stuff on the guy. And they like, and you see all these brothers are so smooth. Like, I'm talking over here, the Namasim's over there. You see a brother trying to hedge in like this, like, you know, just... You know, another guy reading the paper right there. <laughs> what are you expecting me to say? I'm saying the exact same stuff I'm telling you right here. There's nothing new yet. You know? So, I remember one time, I went to New Jersey. Give the Dao workshop on a Saturday. Sunday we went out for some street Dao, broke into groups and stuff. And at, we come back, we reconvened at the end of the day. And he, all the groups, the pairs, they were t telling, you know, about their experience. The number of shahadas, basically, they got. It was a number of days back then. So one guy, he was a young kid, and, you know, he attended the workshop and everything, and, and he's just waiting for my group to say what the number. So this, this group, one shahad. This group, two shahad. And I'm watching this little kid. And then it came for our group. <coughs> okay, brother, come on, your group. And then this kid was just like, Waiting, anticipating, and we said zero. And this kid was like, Phew. <laughs> <laughs> Brother Kamal, all that talk yesterday, this is the technique, and zero shahada? Yeah, it's not magic. <laughs> it's not like I've got something phenomenal that I didn't tell you that you got to sneak up behind me and hear it. Oh, that's how he does it. <laughs> Remember? Allah does the rest, you do your part. Allah. Yes, sir. Our question is, uh Lots of times people raise this question about the source of some marrying Aisha. Is, uh, so, if you're saying that you don't want to be evasive and stuff like that, you address it. How do you address the issue not being evasive? I'm talking about maybe just give an example specific for this issue. Right. Well, okay. Let me, let me, we're, those, all these issues we're going to come and answer them, inshallah. What I'm trying to do right now is tell you that if someone does ask you a question about an issue, address that issue. Don't try to run around and, and, and escape it. How we address the issue, that's when we're going to discuss later on. But for now, what I want you to know is if someone asks you a question, don't escape it. It looks very bad. So answer the question. You might say, well, I don't know the answer. That's what we're coming to tomorrow, I think, inshallah. Yes, sir? What about having more than non-Muslim? Uh, more than one non-Muslim uh, Muslim. What about having more than one wife? What did you say? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, kidding, sister. Yes, kidding. I love 
how when I do these things, that all my jokes, like most of the sisters just don't find them funny. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, what about having more than one non-Muslim listening to you? Like uh, two or three? Fine. Yeah. Uh, Fine. Is that if you but if they start to, you know, affect each other with their negativity, it's too good to split them apart if you can. But if you can't, fine, talk to them. You can talk to 50 at one time if you want to. It's not an issue yet. You know? It's not. Because then you might have to address each, every one of them. Yeah, it's sometimes not everything is within your control. You know? It's not like you can always get the ideal da'wah situation. Sometimes you start talking to one guy, and he's actually there with 19 of his beer buddies, and they're all hammered or whatever. And what are you going to do now? You can't always get it the way you want. So you just you deal with your situation. You know? I have two questions. Okay. The first one is that uh, when you are talking about like going out in groups, what is the number, minimum number of brothers are actually going in one group? And the maximum they, number? They break up into groups of two, pairs. Just okay. One, two, that's it. But your whole crew, you, let's say you took a bus of 50 people to hit this, <coughs> let's say Central Park in New York, big place, and then they break up into groups of two. That's it. Okay, but then when you come back, you're reporting to one Amir or something? Or? Uh, we're just sharing. I mean, you can have an Amir if you want, but we're just talking about We all sit down. I usually insist that the Dua'at come and sit and talk after the event, because if we're at 10 groups and we all spent one hour out there, if I get the, the you know, this person says, this group tells us the report, this guy asks us this tough question, this is how we answered it. Or how do you think we could have answered it? And then we all put our, you know, do the input. So when you share, when the, all the 10 groups talk about their one hour of experience, it's as if you got 10 hours of experience from their feedback. That's why, by the way, if you look at uh, any salespeople in the audience, men or women, great. Now, um, I don't know which kind of environment you work in, but a lot of times uh, you'll find that within a sales team or sales force, they have the short cubicles. The, the cubicle wall doesn't extend above the desk. Purposely, they do that for the sales team. Why? They want the sales team to talk together. They also sometimes give them breaks, companies, where it's you know, all sales oriented. They give them lunch break together. They want them to talk so they can share different techniques. So we use the same technique with du'a. I want to hear your experience. I'll learn from it, you know? And you know, I'll learn your way, and that's why Honestly, that's why tomorrow I will ask you how you would answer the question. And so many times I, I would hear such a perspective that I never considered before. You know, Over the years I've got some excellent responses, things I never, I never considered. So I benefit from your experience and you benefit from my experience. And then, just like the sales team, the sales force. So, um, so that's, go ahead. The second question is, that, do you have some sort of like arrangement, just like for the brothers, do you also recommend the same stuff for the sisters as well, or...? Yeah, I mean, most of the things that we're talking about can, today and tomorrow can be done by brothers and sisters, okay? Um, like, I wouldn't recommend sisters have a weekly or a daily table in front of a metro station or bus station, you know? But, uh, I mean, I would recommend they do that in a probably you know, a school or a safer place, something like that. But generally, for the most part, most of the things that the men can do, the sisters can do. Sometimes there's some things to tweak here and there. A lot of time. There was another question, your sister? I don't know if this is as much of a question as an observation, but in my personal experience living in Canada, a lot of times they're really afraid to approach the men because they're afraid of the men. So whenever they want to ask me a question, they're always like, oh, I don't mean to offend. And I find that they're a lot more anxious. I don't know how to get them comfortable. <coughs> I let them know that it's always okay to ask. But That's it. That's the right way. I mean, there's nothing you can do beyond that. You just let them know. No, 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 not, no question is offensive, or no question is, a, is not a good question, and, and I'm here, that's what I'm here for. Feel free, please, to talk to me. Just like that. Use their name. Do all these things. Smile. Do all these things that will get them to try to, try to open up to you a little bit. So that's it. Yeah, there's nothing beyond that that I know of that you can do. Okay. Um, right, let's look at some creativity over here. You know, handshakes. I'm talking about men with women and women shaking hands with men. What are your ways of avoiding handshakes? Share with us. Yes, sir. I just sneeze. You're serious, huh? You know, that's actually one of my jokes that I tell. <laughs> because uh, there's a guy who said that. said, you know, when a woman comes, I start going... <coughs> and like, hi, how are you? you know? So now she doesn't want to try to shake that hand. So you actually do sneeze, huh? Okay, good. Can you do a good sounding... Not now, but can you do a good sounding sneeze? 
No? Because my, my fake sneeze sounds really fake. You know? I don't think. But if you could do a pull off a good one, and you put glue between your hands, so when you don't finish it, it's very convincing, right? <laughs> Other techniques, yes, sir. Have candy in your pocket and you give it. Okay, all right. So you must walk around with a full bag of uh, all the time. You know? Anytime you see a woman, yes, sir. Uh, this is kind of like a technique. Mm -hmm. that involves like snorting your nose. If the husband is beside them? Yes, <laughs> No, actually, even then, it can't happen. But okay. But so, what the brother is doing, but Zakam he's going now the other route, the explaining. So now, let's hear specifically some explanations, some just explanations for now. How would you explain it verbally? My brother told me at a job interview, uh -huh. he just said, uh, because of Islam's respect for women, I don't shake hands. Uh, nice. Because of Islam's respect for women, I don't shake hands with women. Nice. What else? Verbally, verbally now. Yes, sir. I don't believe I have the right to touch. Oh, there you go. Where'd you get that from? <laughs> huh? What's that? Mr. CD, I listened to a while back. Really? Yeah, his name is, you might know him actually, this speaker. Uh huh. The, the course is called Yogi Shahab. <laughs> You're joking, right? You're joking, right? No, I, I got that from you already. Okay. <laughs> all right, now, all right, fine, exactly. Uh, yeah, so this brother is a poet, and he words it so nicely, he says, I don't have the right to touch you. <laughs> and so, you know, people are like, wow, oh, I know, is that special, you know, it's very nice. <laughs> what are the explanations? <coughs> I said, this brother says, I don't have the right to touch you, to women. And they feel that it's very honored and respected, it's, it's kind of nice. He doesn't have to go through the whole list and, you know, what we can, you know, aunts we can shake hands with. Uh, you know, cousins know, but so it's kind of nice and quick and, and oh, at the same time yes. very, you know, I don't know what the word is, not romantic, but flowery. <laughs> Anyone else? So yes, sir. I just said, please forgive me. <laughs> I like you, man. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, please forgive me. <laughs> just come <don't. laughs> Just forgive me. <laughs> All right. Okay, good. What else? And how's, how does that work for you? <laughs> you know, <laughs> yes? Just a question, what about if it's a reverse for sister? I'm waiting for sisters to say something. What do you say? Because you could say the same things, you know. No. The Islam are not allowed to touch her and shake hands with the opposite thing, you know. Yeah? Go ahead. I would just break to my religious, I don't shake hands with them. Okay, and that, that will work. I think most people will understand that. So it's a religious thing, and you're politely apologizing that you're not going to be shaking my hand. They'll accept that. Yes? Sorry? No, still. Even if you're wearing gloves. Just. Now, of course, please, and I know one time I asked, what are, we're trying to think of creative alternatives. One time some guy put his hand up and said, well, Sheikh uh, so and so gave a fatwa that it's okay. I, I understand that. There's a fatwa for everything. We're trying to be creative beyond. <laughs> I'm not trying to be rude, I'm just trying to say we're trying to be creative beyond the fatwa. Because like I just said in the beginning, avoiding handshakes, Sheikh so and so said there's a fatwa you can shake hands. Okay, next point. But I'm trying to be creative here beyond the fatwa. Yes, sister. Should you necessarily offer them Okay, so maybe the sister saw that these are a little apologetic, and even though other, others amongst us might see it as just an explanation, but you might have something, you know, more of an explanation and according to you, less of an apology. If you, if you do, then feel free to use that. Um, if you feel that yours is a bit apologetic, you might you know, kick it up a notch or something like that. Yeah? I would say, I don't mean to offend you, but my religion would not allow to shake hands. Okay, very nice. Yes, sir? Or just give her a pamphlet, keep her hand, their hands busy. Uh-huh, very good. Yes? <laughs> Explanations? I don't think I will have any problem telling her the same thing that the brother said. Uh -huh. I was taking a class, uh, here in Calgary, and I had a Jewish guy sitting beside me, old beer, practicing Jewish, and the teacher was trying to shake his hand because we were playing a role, mm -hmm. and he pulled it, 
I'm very sorry not to offend you, but it's religious purposes. I can't shake your hand. Excellent. It's a Jewish person right beside me. Good. So I don't think it's any problem. Excellent. Excellent. And then when she came to shake your hand, you said, I'm his cousin. She asked <laughs> 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 right? Uh huh. There you go. Excellent. Very good. Five. Excellent. Dr. Mufek. Now, very good. Very creative crowd. There's some other people who used, um, who were saying that you occupy your right hand. Who said you said that? Yeah, you gave her. So you give her something, and that's another method that we that we were taught at this company. He said when the, it was a Muslim company, so they said if a woman extends her hand to shake your hand, you put your business card in her hand, and then you bring the you turn the her attention to the card. So, and it works so wonderfully. So she extends her hand, you say, well, I'm, you know, I'm Kamal, that's my name, that's fine. You turn the attention to the card, because if you just give her the card, she might take it and then put her hand. <laughs> what do you do? <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> so, and we used to walk around that company, we had cards everywhere. I mean, I had cards here, here. You go like this, a card would pop up something. Because, you know, suddenly someone would come in. Then we used to ask them, did you notice that I didn't shake your hand? And they would actually say, no, I didn't notice, I did not notice. Kind of like what Baba Shiraz was doing earlier with, you know, look, looking. It's as if you're looking, but you're not. They won't even probably not even notice it. Um, and here, same thing. We'd ask them, did you notice I didn't shake your hand? They would say, no. Well, actually, because of religious reasons, and you explain. And because of that, now you've explained and saved yourself from the goodbye handshake. So it works well. So if you do have a pamphlet, fine. Now what if you don't have a pamphlet? You can do this other thing where you, you occupy your right hand. And you don't make any effort to free up your right hand. And so, and you start the greeting. Because there's a greeting with the handshake and there's one without. So if you come up to someone like this, they might expect that you quickly free up your right hand and shake their hand, right? But what if you come up to them like that, for example? And you say, hi, how are you? I'm the one who called you on the phone. My name is so-and-so. And you're doing this, like very clearly, I'm not, or suppose even your left hand's in your pocket. I'm not making any effort to free up my right hand, you know. And you will actually see, see them, they will look at your hand, and then they start to free up the right hand, and then they leave it alone, you know. Um, I used to work somewhere, a lot of uh, sales people would try to come and, and get our business, and one of them, a lot of times sales women would come. And you would see them, because they're part of sales at firm handshake. And I would occupy my right hand. And they would start to put the folder on the other hand, then they see I'm not making any effort to free my right hand, and they just talk, and they even say goodbye without trying to... So you can, there are ways where you can even stop someone from initially putting their hand out, psychologically. Also now, as the brother was saying, when you have your wife with you, or your husband with you, there's no need to, sh to shake the other person's hand, because your wife will save the day if a woman lunges at you, and if a man you know, tries to you, you save the day. So... Uh, <laughs> Ahmed said, <laughs> man tries to shake your wife's hand, he's here, grab his hand, and then from there you go, and you go. <laughs> yeah, that's good. You just want to stay awake after lunch, that's all. Uh, all right, so that's as far as the handshakes. How about, how about um, anything else that I forgot with the handshakes? Yes. And that's why you try to keep your explanation as nice, as sweet as possible. And in the end, Yanni, what are you going to do? If you're one of those people who want compromise there, what are you going to do? You're going to. I would rather offend them than offend the law at some point, you know? Go ahead. I think these days people have a lot more cultural sensitivity than we give them Much before. more, yes. And actually they would be more interested. A lot of times when I say, sorry, I can't shake hands, they're like, oh, really, why? And then they actually ask, cause, especially if they're business people, because they don't want to offend someone else later on. Right. Very good. Excellent. So, and it's very true, Yanni. Go to an Arab country and you refuse to shake a woman's hand. Oh, yeah, yeah, the things that you'll hear. <laughs> what, am I a dog? Huh? Am I impure? Huh? <laughs> What's the matter with you? Kofar don't say these things to me. You're saying this to me. And, and uh, one time, uh, true story. Go ahead, sister. Is the issue that some Muslims uh, don't think that shaking hands is haram? So when you are telling a non-Muslim that you are not supposed to shake hands because of religion, 
Muslim and they shake hands. They shake hands. So what, what are you talking about? Why are you not united on, on some Well, side? yeah. And actually, I found that Muslims are best offended by refusing to shake their hand more than non Muslims. Yes, that's true. That's true. Yeah. So basically, what if what if sometimes you, you refuse to shake a woman's hand? She says, "Well, I have a lot of Muslim friends, and uh, they shake my hand. Tell them, well, they're, they're different. I'm actually a kind of Muslim. I'm called fundamentalist Wahhabi Muslim." <laughs> So what are you gonna do, right? I mean, one time I went to work somewhere, and the lady said you have to shave your beard. I said no. She said, well, my boyfriend is Muslim, and he shaves his beard, and he's got a girlfriend. And you're using him as an example, a role model now. So you, you deal with these things all the time. True story. I won't say the chef's name, though, respectable scholar. And the uh, woman, young girl, became Muslim. So she says, I want my mother to meet you tomorrow. He said, fine, just let her know that we don't shake hands in Islam with women. So the next day, the girl brought her mother, and her mother came to the sheikh, and she said, my daughter tells me, you guys don't shake hands. Quickly, hug the sheikh. <laughs> Sometimes they don't get what it means, yeah, you know. One time, but, so, when, when you give da'wah, who likes to use the name Allah? Put your hands up. Okay, and who likes to use God more? And who uses both? Excellent. And who gives no da'wah whatsoever? Keep your hands up. <laughs> okay. So, look, uh, I, I mean, I love to use Allah, but I also use God. It's not an issue. But there are two things I want to talk about very quickly on this point. One, why some Muslims don't like to use Allah. And two, the benefit of using Allah. Some Muslims don't like to use Allah because they think the non-Muslim might think Allah is some other God. So, oh no, this is going to be happening for a while. Oh. Okay. Anyways, some Muslims think that if I say Allah, they might think I'm talking about some other God. So, the answer to that, the, the remedy to that is just a quick 15 second disclaimer. So you just say, so Allah sent his prophets, and by the way, Allah means is the same, it just means God in Arabic. It's the same God of the Christians, the same God of the Jews. It just means God in Arabic. And if you go to a church in any Arab country, the Bible says Allah. And they say in church, Allah. Understood? Understood. That is, that's the end of the problem. That's it. And by the way, there are very few people who, if any, who believe this whole moon God thing. So most of the time people understand that Allah is God. It's just the name of God in Arabic. Explain to them like that. And you can feel free to change your inner and go between using Allah and saying God as well. The thing, the advantage of saying Allah is that it sets you apart from everybody else. The Jehovah's Witness knocked on their door and said, God, you know, this person, you know, the Mormons knocked and they said, God. And when you say God, you sound like they have, you know, you need to submit to God. Well, I do submit to God. You need to submit to Allah. So it feels like I need to move towards Allah. It will set you apart in your speech from everybody else. I mean, I know you don't say Lord, but imagine you said, you need to submit to the Lord. Just, oh, he sounds so Christian now. <laughs> but, <clears throat> any, anything quickly there on the Allah part? So, there's no rule that says you have to use Allah or you have to use God. Use both, but if you're afraid that you might misunderstand who Allah is, give a quick disclaimer, quick explanation. Yes? So, what if you told them that Allah comes from the root word, uh, al one God? Fine. Fine. You can... Uh, we can go even further and, and from Allah Ya'lahu, but yeah. just whatever, if brief will suffice, Alhamdulillah, if not, you can up it up a notch. Yes, sir. So you're saying that in Arabic Bible, the word God has been mentioned as Allah? Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, okay, clothing, and this is, I'm trying to get something else out of the discussion, point number three. Suppose I'm going to give street down. Not that I do, but suppose I'm giving street down. Uh, well, you know, I don't know if this works for Canada, this question or not, but let's, let me take you to the U.S. You can just guess here, all right? I'm not really interested in what the answer is. I just want to get to another point. Suppose we're going to give da'wah in Washington, D.C. Should who, How many people think it would be more effective if I put on some white thobe versus some pants? Put your hands up. The thobe is more effective. How many people think it's more effective if I put on pants and a shirt? Hands up. Okay. 
Those who didn't put their hands up, I don't know what you're wearing for that one. <laughs> now, you, maybe you think, well, both are probably the same. Who thinks they're both equal? Okay. You know, what we found from collective years of, of collective, I said, I'm, just, I'm not saying this is what I found, a lot of du'a over the years, we found there isn't really much of a difference. Not really. Now, I know someone now is thinking, well, I can think of a scenario where if you're wearing a thobe, you could get shot. Probably is a scenario like that. <laughs> and at the same time, I can think of a scenario where if you wear a thobe, you come off as more, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Yeah. Um, okay. a, a credible, yeah? So, the truth is, yeah, there could be some weird scenario, but in general, we didn't find much difference. You know that? But actually, believe it or not, the, the slight edge we found in that scenario that I mentioned, not saying put on a thobe and stand in the uh, north uh, courtyard, but I'm saying in that scenario that I mentioned, we actually found that there's a slight advantage to the thobe, believe it or not. Because people think of you as a little bit more credible. They think of you as clergy within your religious system, as someone with rank, even though we don't have rank. And at the same time, the thobe also brings you down. Now, remember, I said that one time, and one guy said that. That's just, I can't believe that. And he, next Friday, he's wearing a thobe, and some non-Muslim said, Hey, so tell me, what is this about? What is this religion? So the thobe does bring you da'wah. And, you know, I remember one time I was at a restaurant, this lady came to me, she said, Are you a rabbi? I said, Yeah, I'm a black rabbi. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Can you be aggressive sometimes in da'wah? Yes? Really? <coughs> Who says yes, put your hands up? Who says never put your hands up? Okay, you can be aggressive sometimes. Who can give us an example from the Prophet ﷺ when he was hard one time? Yes, sir? When uh, Omar al-Khattab was coming to him when walking the Prophet ﷺ, and he grabbed him. When Omar on and came to the Prophet ﷺ, wasn't he aggressive with him? Yes. Didn't he grab him and shake him? Don't do it next week, please. <laughs> Don't shake anybody. But so, any other times you can think of in the Sira? Was it? Is that right? Okay, I didn't know that. Khalid and Walid? Okay, any other thing? What about you became Muslim? No, there wasn't, it wasn't, it was actually very gentle with him. Very gentle. You told him that I want to see your face again? No, no, it wasn't like that. <laughs> it wasn't like I don't want to see your face again. It was actually the Prophet ﷺ, because he's the Prophet of Allah, didn't want to do any injustice to a sheep. So he said, make sure I don't see you, just so that, because the Prophet was so hurt by what Wahshi did, that the Prophet, because this is the Prophet of Allah, people, he didn't want to even grimace or lose a smile if he, if he was smiling and he saw Wahshi and the smile disappears, out of the Prophet of Allah, that's very, very harsh and very hurtful. So the Prophet was so detailed and delicate that he didn't even want to frown at the face of Wahshi if he ever saw him. Because when he sees Wahshi, he will remember the hurt, his face will change. That's how detailed the Prophet was. He didn't even want to affect him that much. That's why he told him, you know, don't let me see you. He didn't mean, you would become Muslim, but I don't want to see your face ever again. That's not how the context. So it was actually very gentle from the Prophet Anyways, the idea is sometimes, or just like the debate, debate is in a sense that one, it's a bit aggressive. You know, I think I tell, tell the story of the, the drug dealer in D.C., you know, we're trying to give him that one. He's just being so arrogant, this guy. He's talking to us about bricks and, you know what bricks are? <laughs> Somebody knows what that is. Because he kept telling me, well, Allah give me a brick if I become Muslim. I said, what's a brick? He said, a brick of cocaine. <laughs> that, apparently, that's the wholesale item, and then they break it down into the retail. <laughs> so, Ahmed, you have to bear with me. I haven't heard all these jokes before. I recycle jokes, you know, it's good for the environment. <laughs> so, um, anyway, so we, we got really aggressive with this guy. I mean, he was just constantly making fun of us, had his beard in his hand. I said, oh yeah? All right. So I started to let him have it about the questions in the grave and so on and so forth. When we left, he was just standing just like this. He was, you couldn't speak, you know? You had to... As the brother said, I had to shock him out of his comfort zone. Anyway, so sometimes it could be sometimes, but generally it's dawah, it's an invitation, it's nice, it's sweet, it's kind, it's you know, it's gentle, 
And you know, some of the best du'a that we know, they're the best because they care. Prophet ﷺ was the best because he cared. Even when they harmed him, he could have retaliated, he cared. And, I mean, that might sound a little bit, you know, wimpy or whatever, but it's actually the truth. Those who care, they're the best du'a. One of the best du'a they had in D.C. used to say, these are my people, I love them. And I want them to come into Islam. That's why he worked better than we did, because he cared. All right, what, what's our time looking like? Uh, is it break? We have 3.40, and we stop at 5. So um, so how about this then? 3.50, we'll take a 10 minute break and start at 4. Okay, so Ahmed will be the timekeeper. Okay, walk away points, you'll know what they are. I can't give you any any guidelines whatsoever. You know, maybe if some, yeah, sure, if someone's intoxicated, you walk away. If they're crazy, you walk away for sure. If they just want to simply argue, remember the point. If they just want to argue for the sake of arguing, you might want to break it off and say, well, you know, it was nice talking to you. This is some reading material, and we're here, you know, for the rest of this week. We're giving, you know, the same place. Feel free if you have any questions, and you break it off, right? But I'm also afraid to tell you give up too quickly, because there's one sister, she used to never give up. And she would send me a message with her partner, you know, come help me out. And I just, look, if he's being difficult, leave him and, and go on to someone else. But she doesn't. And then every time I look, she's still giving da'wah. And then in the end, they're calling me to tell the guy here to say the shahad. So I learned from her, don't give up too quickly, you know. So you'll have to figure it out. The time when you walk away, but when do you walk away exactly, you'll, you'll know when you walk away. Question? Yes. Sorry, I can't hear you. If you're if intoxicated, uh -huh. opposite gender, and you're stuck with them because you're a bus ride or something, and they're actually asking you something pertaining to Islam and religions, where do you draw the line as a sister? If they're intoxicated? Yeah, and they ask you about your age. Okay, well, I mean, there's, uh, I mean, I guess we need to define how, I mean, I hate to use these terms, but we have to, let's say, determine if the person is tipsy or hammered or wasted or <laughs> all these other terms that they have. So if you're just tipsy, yeah, I think you could probably keep, I mean, as, as a brother, I know. Um, I can't give you a fatwa, but as a brother, if someone's a bit tipsy, you can keep talking to them. If they're with their mental faculties are there, they understand what you're saying. If they're a little beyond, if they're beyond, you know, understanding and tomorrow they won't recall any of this, don't waste time, I don't care what he's asking about, you know. Tell me about the form of that, I'm sure, some other time. You know? So I wouldn't waste my time if someone is beyond the point of comprehending what I'm saying. But as a sister, especially, I mean, I think in your scenario you didn't say that you're alone with the person, right? Because I would say, get out of there, and the guy's drunk already, and that's not a good situation. But if, yeah, and it's a public place, he's a little bit beyond comprehending what you're saying, don't waste any time. You know, say, you know, contact the MSA tomorrow when you sober up. Take a cold shower, drink some coffee, then talk to somebody else. So, like, what else is the. Uh, okay. You know that if you look at the ayah that mentioned da'wah, they all say, like, look at this verse. Right? Call to the way of your Lord. Whoever calls to Allah. So when it says da'a ila Allah, ila it's telling you, it's an indication that there is ikhlas there. Because you're calling to Allah Azza wa Jal. And when it's for Allah Azza wa Jal, it's not about you. It's not about your ego. You don't get personally offended if someone, and this is the key, if someone refuses to take your pamphlet. You don't get upset if someone, you know, you know, makes an argument and he's just trying to, you know, and he's got an ego and he says something that attacks your pride. You don't get offended because it's all about Allah Azza It's all for the sake of Allah Azza wa That's why ikhlas is the most important part in your da'wah. The most important thing. But of course it's also one of the most difficult things as well. 
So set out doing it for the sake of Allah. The whole week, this whole week is for the sake of Allah Azawajal. I'm calling to the religion of Allah Azawajal, to the deen of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So therefore if the person refuses, I did my job. Okay? It's not about my reputation as a da'iyah, that I'm going to be the best da'iyah out of the students, that I have the largest number of shahadas. That's why this whole number thing doesn't work. Not only does it push you to get cheap quality shahadas for the sake of counting the numbers, but it's not about you. It's about the religion of Allah Azza wa Jalla. And that's why if there's a khlas, so many things won't, won't matter. So many things won't matter. Your title, the name on the poster, all these things don't matter. If it's for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jalla. So, the good news is you can always refresh your niyyah and renew your niyyah in Islam. So for example, you're, you decide, okay, for this whole week I'm going to be giving da'wah with the MSA. Islam Awareness Week, it's all for the sake of Allah Azza wa Tuesday, things start to creep into your niyyah, right? Because you got one or two shahadas and then all the brothers are like, wow, you're the best amongst us. And we all want to spend some time and learn from your techniques and get some of your, some of your barakah and all that. So now things start to get to your head. Good news is, Tuesday night, you can refresh your intention, renew your intention for Wednesday morning. And so, constantly don't let the shaitan come to you from this door. Always refresh your intention, renew your intention. Remind yourself that it's about Allah, it's for the religion of Allah, it's not about you, your reputation, or what have you. So, um, you know, what are the, uh, can I see the, the first slides? Thank you, sir. Can I, look, can we go to the first page? Slide number two. Look at that verse. Yani Allah says in that verse, وَمَا أَنْتَ بِهَادِ الْعُمْيَ عَنْ ضَلَالَتِهِمْ إِنْ تُسْمِعُ إِلَّا مَنْ يُؤْمِنُ بِآيَاتِنَا فَهُمْ مُسْلِمُ So, you cannot guide the, the blind from their strain. You, know? you, only, you can only cause them to hear you know, the, the proofs, the ayat. You can only cause them to see these signs or to hear these signs, or to know these signs. That's your job, to direct them to that, to let them know that. I'm sorry, I see that. And uh, we said that one, من أحسن قولنا من دعا إلى الله It's for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal. And at the same time, you know, the third slide there, on the last one on that page, you see the rewards, you, know, if, you see the rewards of da'wah. And it just keeps multiplying, and it keeps going on and on. If you bring one person to Islam, you know, the one, his one brother is very business-minded and he showed me this idea that he had of and if, one, if two people become Muslim, or if one person becomes Muslim and he marries and, and they have children and they raise them upon Islam, within 10 years the number of their, if, suppose each, you know, they just get two children, the number of offspring that, and reward that will be related to you is phenomenal. Within 10 years, how many people have become Muslim because of you and your reward keeps going. Then he does it like within 50 years, within 100 years, and it comes up to be a huge number of people. You're in your grave and you're still getting good reward, you know? Now, and, but what if we, yeah, the Prophet said, that for Allah to guide one person through you, it's better for you than the whole world and everything that's in it. Or better for you than the best of wealth. If we really felt that, how much da'wah would we do? If we really felt that. Or that your reward keeps multiplying and multiplying. You teach one person salah you get reward every time they pray. And then they teach 10 people salah, you get reward every time these 10 people or these total 11 people pray. Now, if there was a stock that worked like that, if a brother comes to you and said, there's a stock and it's going to multiply just like your ajr. Same way. But you have, it's going to close in one hour. You have to put everything you can in. You act like crazy to put, get, gather all your money and put it in because it's going to multiply so much. What if we really felt like this about the hadith and our ajr when we give down? How much da'u would we really give? <clears throat> give a tremendous amount of time. So try to take these things to heart. Do it for the sake of Allah. Do it taking the reward with Allah. Let me see. Okay. Slide number three. Like, what if someone is being very argumentative with you? Huh? Five minutes? Okay. What are ways you can stop someone from arguing with you? Just like that guy, you know? Yes, sir? Basically, asking him, like, what's your main issue or something, like, just clarify what 
what he wants to go, go about and then answer that question, things like that. Okay, that's nice. I've never heard that. Just make him like you're saying something for it. Or maybe just uh, make, him, like, make him not confident about his arguments. Like, something like say, okay, I didn't understand what you're talking about the whole time. So like, I didn't understand your point, but you can go back or something. Mm -hmm. Or maybe I can clarify back what you're saying so that he stops. So everything you say, he argues, you know? Okay, so you say there's one God, well, how do you know? Well, we have the, so how do you know that? How do you know this? How do you know? What if they just arguing with you so much? So, good, okay, so you're saying what, what's, what are you really looking for? What's your issue, huh? But, yes? Sorry? Okay, but what, but it's not just, he's just arguing, repeating one argument. He is, which is, you're right, if that was the case, if that were the case. But here he keeps, whatever you say, he's just jumping on it. And we, they actually took us to a place like this one time. These people were arguing over every little point. And we just came up with one sentence. Every time we'd say it, they would stop arguing. Yes, sir? I would say, I don't understand what you're saying. Okay. And that would stop it from arguing. And then just start one time. Okay. But, yes? What do you, uh, what do you hope to gain? What do you, have to, what do you hope to gain, huh? Yeah. What do you hope to gain from arguing with me like this, huh? Okay. Anyone else? Sisters? Someone keeps arguing with you, yes? You're wrong, huh? <laughs> wow. Okay. You married, sister? <laughs> yes, kidding. I push it sometimes. It just come out. Right? <laughs> the husband's in the room, he's probably. <laughs> I don't know that, sister. <laughs> now we know what you go through at home. You're always wrong. Yes, sir. <laughs> Okay, you throw a question back. But, they, but they're still going to keep going. How do you stop them from being argumentative? Yes? Um, you can just say, okay, why don't you think about what I told you, and I'll think what you're saying, uh -huh. and then we can be able I like that. Very nice. Never heard that one before. Yes, sir? Argue back. Argue back? <laughs> you're trying to stop him from arguing. Argue back? <laughs> you're actually letting him win now. Hamad? Let him answer his own question. Like, what do you think? Why do you think we do this? Uh huh. Nice. I like that. Why do you think we're doing this? Uh huh. Was just Tom straight up to argue? Oh, I like that. What is that? We can't. We just you missed it. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> he said, "Just say I'm not here to argue," and that's what we were doing. This was Austin, Texas. They took us to this place. Everybody was arguing. The minute you just start to speak, they argue with you. So we were just. We were just ending it the whole day. We were just telling people, look, I'm not here to argue with you. And they would say, me neither, go ahead. What if you tell, I mean, look, what are the chances you tell someone, look, I'm not here to argue? And they say, well, I am. <laughs> There's not much of a chance. But if some, because one time it did happen to me, actually. I thought I was all smart. I said, I'm not here to argue. He said, I am. <laughs> so, well, that makes life easy for me. Because if you're only here to argue, then we can't get anywhere. Because you're just going to argue. If I give you the truth, you're going to argue. So let's do this. At, this was a coworker. So I said, let's do this at another time when you really want to find out what the truth is. Okay, I don't want to argue. That, I ended it because he just told me, look, I'm going to be a jerk today. So okay, I'll end it. But what the brother said, tell him, look, I'm not here to argue. Most people, especially the stranger, will say, well, Wallahi, they used to tell. I'm telling you, we did it a number of times at that one place, and they would say, I'm sorry, go ahead. Or like, I'm, well, me neither. Go ahead. You know, that's it. You start arguing, you, you, they, you lose. You did what they wanted you to do. There's another way also. You can just totally ignore the fact that they're being argumentative. And just, say, you know, just take your take it, you just take your time, or let me finish the point, and I'll you know, like that. Yes, sir? Perhaps you could give them an analogy, an analogy that could uh, make them understand why you would. There's no point to argue. And what, and what you know, I think it was a commentary, mm -hmm. gave the um, analogy of uh, God. Oh, so you're telling you that's an analogy to deal with argument, yeah. arguing, yeah. argumentation. Okay, great. You could give them that analogy as well. Very nice. Play. Um, okay. So let me. Let me uh, Oh, it's time to take a break, sorry. All right, it's, uh, it's break time.
Um, this is this is not salah time. This is a ten minute break. Okay. Does the sisters want this break for me at all, or I can just do what I do? Okay. I mean, oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the organizers. They were saying they were going to pray asr after we're done at five. Yeah. Yeah. If that's okay with everybody, then we'll do one hour, then we'll do Asr. So this is a break, 10 minutes, and there we go. And I'm going to be here.